So an interesting story. You all know this story pretty well, don't you? Because it appears sometimes in a lot of children's books. It's one of those stories that is kind of plastered everywhere. Jesus heads out in a boat with the disciples. They're on the lake. A storm comes up. The storm is bad. The disciples freak out, right? Because water's slapping over the sides of the boat. They wake Jesus up. He calms everything, and it's all good, right? End of the story. There's a lot going on in that story. Some things we got to unpack and process. And one of the things that we have to unpack is the question that Jesus asks the disciples once they wake him up. Why are you afraid? You have little faith. You have little faith. Uh, I've got some interesting perspective on this scripture text a little bit. I, if I was to write my own commentary, I would reflect this being the reason why Jesus got a little upset at the disciples for waking him up in the boat. I mean, it sounds like a stern rebuke, doesn't it? I mean, you have little faith, you know. Why are you afraid? You know. See, I believe that Jesus had been traveling all over the countryside with his disciples, been doing miracles, performing a tremendous things, and flocks and flocks and groves and groves of people were following him all over the place, and he was exhausted. And so he got in the boat, and for a moment, as they set out into the lake, nobody was bothering Jesus. It was the perfect time to take a nap. And he had just fallen into the deepest sleep when the storm came up, but not even the storm woke him up. Have you ever slept through a storm because you've been so exhausted? Anybody out there? When Hurricane Wilma came through, I slept through the whole hurricane, okay? <laughs> Leslie and Sylvia Baptista and my daughter were in their bed. They were scared to death, and I was like... <laughs> Partially because the preparation for a hurricane is exhausting, right? I mean, putting boards up and getting everything ready, I was tired. I think Jesus was that tired. And he got in the boat, and finally, he had a moment's rest. And then the little panickers, right? The disciples. A little storm comes up, starts rocking the boat. Water's coming over the side. What are we going to do? We're going to drown, you know? And they wake him up. Jesus, come on. We're going to drown. Save us. And he gets up, and he says, why are you so afraid? I'm taking a nap. Now, you can ask Jesus when we all enter into God's future whether that really happened. I'm not sure it did happen that way, but it's the perspective I've always had of that passage. Jesus is exhausted. His disciples panic. They lose sight of who's with them. They wake him up. He's ticked because he was taking a nap. And then he calms everything down, but he doesn't just calm the storm. He calms everybody. It's an important part of the story, right? It's not just that he calms the wind in the lake that's raging around them. He also calms everybody in the, in the boat. He calms their fears. I mean, fear's a real thing, isn't it? You all struggle with fears? Now, there's different levels of fear, right? I mean, uh, fear can be a good thing. Matter of fact, uh, it's one of the great evolutionary gifts Matter of fact, when people survive, it's because fear has drawn them away from dangerous situations. Nobody goes jumping off a cliff, right? Or running out in a lightning storm carrying a metal bat, which, by the way, is another story I experienced. <laughs> when we were in Sebring, or, or no, it's Haines City, Florida, we had a softball team. First United Methodist Church, Haines City, we were battling First Baptist Church. <laughs> we were in the middle of the sixth inning, and it was back and forth. When all of a sudden a huge thunderstorm came up, lightning's passing. And I said, everybody in the dugout. And we all ran in the dugout. And the Baptist church who was in the field said, why are you leaving the field? Don't you have any faith? And I said, no, I have a brain. I'm not standing out in a lightning storm holding an aluminum bat. That's good fear. That's rational fear. That's fear that helps us survive. But fear can get out of control, can it? I mean, that immediate rational fear, that, that's survival. But sometimes it can take control of you. Rob Bell, he talks about in a lecture he gave years back about emotions and human emotions and how we can allow human emotions to take control. And the image he uses, he says, you're driving your car 
And in the back seat of the car are all of the human emotions gathered back there, like kids in the back seat. And every so often you have to put your hand back there and go, quiet down now, quiet down now. Because they get all riled up. For those of you who are not parents, you have no idea what we're talking about. Unless you were in the back seat, right? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. He says, occasionally those emotions rise to the surface and they get sick of the radio station you're playing. And they reach up and they'll try to change the station. And then you just slap their hand and they go back. Or occasionally they might get their station on. He says, but that's normal. That's what human emotions do. They become dangerous when you let them take the wheel. Because fear, well, it can become a phobia. Anybody have any phobias out there? You all? Yeah. Dan Baptista, our lead guitar player, who might be watching us right now, <laughs> is afraid of flying. It's an irrational fear. It consumes him. He doesn't understand where it comes from. He doesn't even know how to control it. It just happens. You might have a fear of flying, too. Anybody out there? I know my mother does. Some are afraid of snakes. Some are afraid of spiders. It's evident that lots of people are afraid of the closet being open. Yeah. I, personally, had a phobia over puppets. Yeah, I know. This is irrational. There's a rational fear that's plagued me my whole life. I've shared this story several times, so I apologize for those of you who heard it, but it's just way too good of a story. You see, I saw a Twilight Zone episode when I was a kid in which the puppet master had a Charlie McCarthy sit-on-your-lap puppet, and he put the puppet in his little case at night, and somebody had cursed that puppet, and it got out of the case, and it came over and stabbed him to death in his bed! That image was implanted in the back of my head, so whenever I saw a puppet, I immediately felt this fear like it was going to attack me. So my parents, in all of their wisdom, thought it would be the best thing to do to help me overcome my fear is buy me a Howdy Doody puppet! <laughs> I'm there on Christmas morning, the package is there, I'm ripping it open, and there's the worst thing I could ever see, sitting there staring back at me. Where do you put that puppet? My mom put it in the closet, which evidently is the most scariest place you could ever put a scary thing, right? This irrational phobic fear. The problem with phobia is that it's gone too far, right? It's like taking the wheel. Next week, we're actually going to talk about worry and anxiety because that's another question Jesus asks, where fear gets way out of control, where you start being afraid of things that haven't even happened yet. Jesus says, why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? I think there's a lot going on in that story. It's not necessarily that I think the gospel writers intended us to read that, you know, kind of like take it just literally and go with it. There's a depth to this story about our relationship with fear and the call that Jesus has placed upon our lives to live as ambassadors of God's love in the midst of the world. What I love about this story, though, is that it appears in all of the three synoptic gospels. Just remember, synoptic gospels are Mark, Matthew, and Luke. The story doesn't appear in John. But they all share this story. One difference in the story between Matthew and Mark is that Mark actually says at the beginning that Jesus invites them to go to the other side of the lake. I think that invitation is important. I'm not sure quite why Matthew left that out. Matthew basically says Jesus gets in the boat and the disciples get in the boat with him. But Jesus is inviting each and every one of us to go to the other side. He's inviting us to leave the life we once knew or that we found comfortable or complacent or average or ordinary and follow him into a new trajectory in which we become ambassadors of love and light in the midst of the world. He's inviting us to cross the lake with him to go to that new place. And while on the lake, they experience the storm. And the storm symbolizes the things we will all encounter and confront throughout life. Anybody out there have a storm in your life? Have you ever had a storm in your life? I'm glad some of you have never had that experience, okay? 
I mean, this is a participatory church. It's okay to raise your hand. I mean, there are storms, and they're going to come, and they're going to go. And it's not just one. You're going to experience multiple storms throughout your life. And the storms are going to rage, and you're going to get worried about being in the storm, right? Jesus invites them to go to the other side to follow him. And in following Jesus, guess what? It doesn't mean you're not going to avoid the storm. The problem is, is that when we're out in the lake sometimes and we're following Jesus, we forget that Jesus is with us. We get so caught up in all of the stuff that's surrounding it that we jump in the boat. And while we're Christ followers and he's right there, we forget he's even in the boat. Until we're in the midst of it all and the water's lapping over the sides of the boat. And then somebody says, you know what? (laughs) Jesus is right here with us. Wake him up! And I think that's the power of the story and the message, right? Is that we can never forget that Jesus is always with us. He's with us through us all, through it all, and he's with us even in the midst of the storm. And when we focus our attention on the presence of Christ with us, even in the midst of it, he brings a calm and a peace that the world can never know and that only he can bring. It doesn't mean that you're not going to experience a storm the next week either. It's just that we can allow ourselves and our lives to get so swirling about that we even forget that Jesus is with us on the journey. I do it all the time. Anybody else want to confess? Let's all participate in this together. I I forget forget Jesus Jesus is with me. All the time. time. And he's ticked ticked. when I wake him up. (laughs) Because he's been there there. the whole time. time. There you go. There you go. Praise be to God, right? Now this issue of fear and contemplation, I mean, this is something that we as a human race have been wrestling with. For a long time. And and it perpetuates a lot of other things, too. It's not just how we deal with fear personally, but it also is how fear affects the entire world. Because believe it or not, fear might be one of the most dangerous emotions of all. Because it leads to other things. Right? I mean, Mahatma Gandhi once said that we think that fear is... Oh, no. Mahatma Gandhi actually said fear is the enemy. He says, we think that the enemy is hatred, but it's not. It's fear. Drawing off of Mahatma Gandhi, the great Yoda. You all know Yoda? (laughs) Do you know this quote, right? He says, first there's fear, and then fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hatred. Hatred leads to suffering. And there's truth in that, isn't there? I mean, fear perpetuates, well, animosity, anger, and hatred towards the other. The root of all of that is fear. If you think about the storm of the world we're living in right now that's spiraling all around, where where people at odds with each other for everything, right? Religion, politics, orientation, you name it. There's an argument about everything. Gun control. People don't seem to be able to sit down in a room and have a conversation. And what perpetuates all that animosity towards each other? You got the answer, right? It's the theme of the sermon. You should get it. All right? It's fear. Fear leads to hatred, anger, hatred, suffering, right? Fear. I think Mahatma Gandhi might have something there. What about you? You know who else lived in a world that was in the midst of a storm? where there was conflict and people were at odds with each other. There's a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Matter of fact, he preached a sermon on this same text in 1933 about fear and about how as a people, as a people of faith in Christ, we need to never forget that even though the storm rages around us in the center of the boat is Jesus, he's always there and we can always call on him and be reminded That as a people of faith, we don't need to fear because God is with us. The reason he preached that sermon in 1933 is because there were some terrible things rising up around him. You know who was rising up in 1933? Adolf Hitler. 
You know what Hitler and the Nazis were doing? They are forcing the swastika into every business and every religious institution in Germany. They were taking over. Christian nationalism had its day. They were burning books and banning books and keeping people apart from each other and labeling people as evil and no good to the point where they were beginning to exterminate the Jewish people themselves. And Dietrich Bonner knew this. He could see it happening. And it created fear throughout all the people in the region of Germany and all over the world. And he was reminding those Christ followers that while the storm rages, we need to remember that the centerpiece of our faith is Jesus, who's in the boat with us. Wake up, Jesus! The water's coming over the sides. And even though he says, you have little faith, why are you afraid? He still calms the storm. He still calms the storm. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Franklin Delano Roosevelt said that in his inaugural address. You know what year that was? 1933. We need to hear today, right? Martin Luther King drew upon a great parable, an old Irish parable. He said, fear came a-knocking at the door, but faith answered, and behold, y'all know the end of that? No one was there. Hmm. It doesn't mean we don't have to deal in that fear is a legitimate emotion if it's rational, but when we let it take the wheel, when we let it take control, it leads to something else. And if you found yourself in that place where it just is spiraling and spiraling and spiraling, it's okay to ask for help. You need to know that. And you need to remember that Jesus is in the center of the boat, but you also are surrounded by a community that loves and cares about you. Amen? Do you want to say something, Pam? Um, fear stands for false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. There you go. Oh, false evidence appearing real. Unless the lion jumps out. <laughs> that's real. That's real. That's right. Yeah, that's rational fear. Yeah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.